So welcome everybody to my uh, latest update talk on uh, what's new in Groovy. Um, we'll cover um, Groovy 2.3 particularly that we released recently and uh, a few words about Groovy 3. And uh, just before really starting, uh, did anybody um, heard the news about the, this new programming language from Apple which they announced yesterday? Uh, let me increase the font size. It's called Swift. And even on their slides, they, they mention Groovy at the uh, Apple keynote. And if you look, if you try to compare Swift and Groovy, there's really, so this stuff is uh, Swift and this stuff is Groovy. And uh, there are many things uh, which look alike, uh, even, even their closures or... Uh, so it's nice to see that Groovy also inspires guys like Apple, you know. So it's quite uh, humbling, uh, you know, even our uh, lazy transformation, they've got something similar. It's kind of, or, or one of my favorite, that's the, uh, you know, the safe uh, navigation uh, operator. C Sharp is going to steal it in the next version, and the Apple is going to steal it as well, to borrow it, let's say, uh, for their uh, programming language. So I invite you to have a look at uh, Swift. There's some uh, good groovy inspiration. So if you want to uh, write some... Uh, Groovy-like applications for iOS. <laughs> That's, uh, you can have a look at that. Anyway, back to uh, the, real, the real thing. So, uh, I'm Guillaume Laforge, I work for Pivotal. And uh, Pivotal, that, uh, that company uh, with all these uh, cool projects, open source projects, and uh, yeah, the, the old spring source stuff, Tomcat, Cloud Foundry, etc. And uh, I'd like to start also by mentioning uh, the Groovy Weekly Newsletter. Who's aware of the Groovy Weekly Newsletter? Yeah, a good proportion. So if you want to uh, get every Tuesday, and that means that tonight I'll have to send the, the, next, uh <laughs> the next issue. Uh, if you want to have a, you know, a weekly email uh, with the, the latest uh, news, the latest presentations, articles, uh, cut snippets, etc. You can subscribe to that stuff, and I also push them on, on my website. So if you are uh, already uh, subscribed to my feed, you, you should be seeing that. Uh, we, also, we also have some uh, presence on uh, Google Plus. So if you go to uh, Google Plus, uh, Google.com Plus Groovy, that's the uh, the Groovy uh, Google Plus page. But we also have a Groovy uh, community on Google Plus, and uh, so we uh, we share some news. And uh, folks can also contribute articles, and uh, then I can pick them up and put them in my Groovy Weekly newsletter. So if you've got some some stuff to contribute, don't don't hesitate. So the agenda. Um, this is the roadmap uh, for Groovy. So we uh, released two two at the end of 2013, and Groovy two three pretty uh, recently, a few a few weeks ago. And we're thinking about adding a short cycle for a Groovy 2.4 release, uh, perhaps with more um, Java 8 friendly things. Uh, for instance, uh, some Groovy FIDE APIs and things like that. And Groovy 3, uh, we'll talk about it later. Um, it's a, it's a, bit, a bit like a, you know, Duke Nukem Forever. It's the, the next version of Groovy, which will be released at some point, but we never quite know when it's going to be out. That's, uh, that's Groovy 3 and the new mob, etc. So Groovy 2.3, that's the key um, uh, topics we'll be discussing. JDK 8 support, trades, etc. Let's go through them. And Groovy 3, uh, the, uh, the, well, we'll go through them afterwards. So Groovy 2.3 first. Groovy 2.3 is the first official version to support JDK 8, which means you can run Groovy 2.3 and beyond on JDK 8. So it doesn't mean we uh, adopted all the new syntax elements of Java 8, but it means we can run on the JDK runtime. But uh, in uh, Java 8, so Java, the language, versus JDK, the, the platform, in Java 8, uh, we've got some interesting new APIs. So there's the new date, time API, etc. But we also have streams 
and uh, in terms of API and in terms of syntax, uh, new uh, language constructs, we have lambdas. And here I have an example, well actually two examples, uh, where I'm creating uh, an int stream. Uh, so they've got their, their kind of range uh, method, a bit like our range uh, operator. And uh, it's going to create a stream of uh, ints from 1 to 100. And you see you've got a for each method. And uh, what you see here, s, uh, arrow, uh, that's uh, the syntax for lambda, one of the various variants of syntax for lambdas. Um, and here, another example, uh, we have, um, we can retrieve a stream of lines, of strings actually, uh, from a file, uh, transform each line to uh, the uppercase, uh, um, upper in uppercase, and then for each you can print them. Uh, oh, I forgot some uh, parents there. Uh, I can fix that actually. Oh, there's this stuff which uh, prevents me up like that. Sorry for uh, the little typo. So this is what you can do now in Java 8, Angelic 8. But actually what's interesting is that uh, you can actually use groovy closures in places where you'd put lambdas. So instead of this lambda syntax here, you can use a groovy closure. Instead of this, uh, again, uh, this lambda here with the for each, you can use a groovy closure, and that's pretty much the same thing. So you can use the stream API, you can use uh, closures instead of lambdas, so you're already ready to use the, the JDK8 uh, APIs and even use stuff uh, like uh, lambdas, but instead replacing them with uh, groovy closures. And uh, in GUI 2.4, we'll uh, think about some uh, additional, you know, groovy GDK methods uh, that we can uh, use to, to make things even uh, nicer on a, from a groovy perspective. Next, traits. That's uh, one of the key features of uh, GUI 2.3. So there's a bit of text to read, but I'll go through uh, all these. So traits, uh, it's a bit like interfaces, but with uh, method bodies. So uh, in Java 8, they introduced default methods in interfaces, so it's a bit similar. It's a nice way, an elegant way of composing behavior, because you can um, define some behavior in a trait and add that uh, to any uh, class. Uh, traits can be stateful, unlike uh, Java 8 interface default methods. And it's compatible with static typing and compilation, so you can have a fast and safe code, like in Java. And you can also uh, implement traits at runtime. So let's have a look at these things. Let's start with the first example. Uh, so I define a, a trait called flying ability. So in terms of um, structure or syntax construct, it looks like a class. If you, uh, you know, remove trait and put class instead, it just looks like a, a class definition with a method. And um <coughs> we introduced uh, a new keyword uh, that's been a long time since we uh, actually introduced a new uh, keyword or uh, syntax change or addition in the Groovy language. But we felt that uh, this new concept deserved a keyword. So that's the, the trait keyword to define a trait. And then uh, a class can implement a trait. So we use the implements keyword here. Then uh, you notice that the bird that we instantiated has got the fly method coming from uh, the flying ability trait. So that's a first example. Next, uh, traits, can, ca traits can be stateful. So you can use the same uh, usual groovy property syntax. So if you say trait name, string name, uh, you're going to have a, uh, a getter, a setter, and uh, a backing field. And then, again, you implement the trait. So a bird, I want to give it a name. And notice that uh, we can use the, um, the usual groovy named argument constructor, which calls the default constructor and then the, the setters, uh, the various for, for the various uh, properties that you've added here with this uh, map-like notation. 
And then you can double check that uh, there's indeed a name property on that bird class, uh, inheriting from uh, the, the name coming from the named trait. You can also do uh, trait uh, inheritance. So let's pick up uh, our named trait here, same as before. But here my flying ability uh, trait is extending uh, the named trait. So trait flying ability extends named. And notice that here in my uh, f updated fly method, I can access, and I think I've got up the little bubble, I can access the name property coming from the parent trait. Then you implement that uh, composite uh, trait, basically. So I implement that one. So you inherit from both named and uh, flying ability. Again, you've got the, the usual uh, name uh, named uh, argument constructor, and you still have the name property that you can access, and you still have the fly method coming from that trait. So you mix the two. And I'm, I'm going to show a slight variant. It's not necessarily the one I advise, uh, but I wanted to show the dynamic aspect. So you should prefer the previous example, but I did some, something similar here with a dynamic aspect. So here, notice that I've got, again, my flying ability trait, but here I'm using the name property. And here, in the context of the flying ability trait, uh, name is defined nowhere, so it's really a, a dynamic variable lookup, okay? But it's going to be coming from somewhere, and it's going to be coming from the named trait, uh, just like before. And here, notice that, so, uh, dynamic access property, here I can implement those two traits, and indeed, uh, we, we will have uh, the name coming from named, and we'll have the fly method coming from the flying ability trait, and uh, because that class implemented those two traits, uh, the name is going to be uh, resolved uh, dynamically. So when I say be fly, it's going to return, I'm a flying colibri with the name coming from the named trait. Okay. So usually you would rather prefer the, the previous version uh, as, uh, as it's um, uh, it also works with uh, static type checking, static compilation, etc. Where, whereas here, obviously, the uh, the name uh, the name property uh, is a dynamic look up, looked up uh, property, so it's not uh, type checkable as is. The dynamic name is interpolated. What happens when there are some conflicts? So let's say I have a kite surfer trait and a web surfer trait with both surf methods. And I have uh, my person, uh, I create an, uh, a hipster person, which extends person, and which implements both traits. So the guy is a kite surfer and a web surfer. And what happens when you call surf? Well, we have those two surf methods, and what's the rule there? So we extend the, t the we extend a class, and we implement uh, two traits. So you see somehow multiple inheritance uh, at play here, thanks to traits. And what happens is that the last declared trait actually wins. So you're going to get web because that's uh, the web surfer, which is the last in the chain. But if you wanted to have a surf return kite instead you could just as well swap uh, the two traits and put kite surfer last so that kite uh, is uh, the, the returned value. But, uh, so you just reverse the order. But if you want to be more specific, you can also do this, which is uh, you override the surf method in hipster, and then you can say kite surfer dot surfer surf to decide which surfer will be the, the one which will be calling for that uh, surf method. So you can be explicit and override surf and use that uh, special syntax, which is like uh, what they did also in, uh, in Java 8 with their uh, default methods. Oh. The, the class always uh, takes precedence over the traits. We are also able to uh, implement traits at runtime. So again, I use my named trait here. 
So I've got an animal. <coughs> so here it's not yet a uh, runtime implementation, but I'll show you the difference. Uh, and let's say I want to have one named animal. Uh, so I create somewhat artificially a new class which uh, implements that trait, but without anything significant in its uh, body. Uh, and then, okay, I can, uh, you know, have the, the name property and so on. But somehow, somehow it's kind of artificial. If you just needed one uh, particular animal with one name, uh, you have to create uh, a new class uh, just for that purpose. So we have something uh, there. We are actually reusing the as keyword in Groovy. So you can say new animal as named. And for this instance here, uh, it's going to uh, behave uh, uh, like a, an animal with a name. And uh, then, OK, I set the name of the animal. I can double check that I can access the property. So you can do that uh, at runtime with the usual as coercion uh, mechanism of Groovy. And you can also implement uh, two traits uh, at runtime. So this time you cannot do as named comma uh, quacks, uh, but there's a special method called with traits, which is available on any uh, object, which allows you to say, okay, I want to, uh, um, to implement uh, two traits uh, at the same time. And well, there are other uh, aspects. Uh, uh, so traits can even have uh, private fields and methods, abstract methods. You can implement interfaces and traits, etc. So there are uh, some more to that. And uh, we, we, we could make a full presentation, a full hour presentation just on traits if we really wanted. And uh, the, 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 the master brain behind traits is uh, Cedric here. So he did a great job with traits in uh, Groovy 2.3. So congrats, Cedric, on that. OK, so next, some AST transformations. Um, so uh, it's in Groovy 1.6 uh, that I, we uh, added uh, Groovy AST transformations. So it's quite old, but uh, release after release, we refined that and added new uh, transformations. We have a new at tail recursive uh, transformation, which was contributed by uh, Johannes uh, Link, and that we integrated into Groovy. So um, methods which are typically recursive, like uh, factorial, when the last step, the last uh, call um, in the recursive definition of uh, the method uh, is the recursive call to itself, that's tail recursion. And we can optimize uh, that case to, instead of creating a huge call stack where, okay, I call fact, inside fact, inside fact, inside fact, you can actually serialize the fact call. But it's true only for tail recursion when factorial is the last stuff that we're calling. If you use the, the naive in, in implementation of factorial, you usually do n times fact uh, here, and it's not tail recursive because you have to do a multiplication after you did the, uh, the last fact call. So it's not tail recursive. So sometimes uh, you might have to uh, somehow rewrite the, the algorithm so that it's really tail recursive. So that's what I did here with the factorial because I'm using an accumulator variable uh, to be able to uh, uh, do the calculation uh, the multiplication, if you will, before the last uh, factorial call is really invoked. And then you can do a factorial 1000, and it's definitely, definitely not going to, uh, um, to uh, generate a, a, a stack overflow exception. We have an at sortable transformation, uh, which was uh, inspired by uh, Andres Almirai's uh, sortable uh, implementation in Griffin. So we uh, take the good stuff as well in our uh, friend uh, projects, like Griffin. Um, so at sortable, you add that annotation to uh, your uh, pogo. And it's going to uh, actually implement all the uh, uh, comparator methods, etc. Uh, so that uh, when you've got, uh, I thought I had a, an example where I was showing it in action. No. Um, so. Uh, you put that on the class, 
and it's going to uh, compare first, well, following the order of the properties which are defined in the class, so, so it's going to compare first by last name, then if the last names are the same, it's going to compare with first name and then with age. Um, there are some options to that annotation, so you can define includes or excludes if you want to say, okay, no, I just want to compare just the names uh, or I just want to compare uh, or to exclude something, so you've got um, some control on what uh, you want to use for comparators. There are also, no, so I don't have the, the little bubble, there are also some useful methods where you can actually retrieve the comparator, the comparator for each of those uh, properties, etc. So there are some uh, refinement to that uh, sortable transformation. So if you want to uh, uh, easily sort uh, things and uh, show them in, uh, you know, in a table, in a desktop application, or in a in a web interface, uh, that's going to be handy, and you you won't have to implement all the comparisons yourself. Up <coughs> uh, in. Uh, uh, it's in Groovy 2.2 that we added at base scripts, I think. Uh, so it's a way of uh, defining a custom base script class for uh, Groovy scripts. So you can say, um, so there was a special, um, a sp you, you could annotate um, a variable with add base script and define the base script class. Uh, but we refined at base script to also be able to use at base script on things like imports and packages. So here I define a base script class which extends uh, Groovy's uh, Groovy Lang uh, script, uh, adding a property, meaning of five. And then in my script here below, so that's my uh, base uh, script, and here below I say, okay, uh, I want to import base script and then use custom base as the base script for that script and I can assert that okay there's a there's a meaning of life uh, property that I can access from uh, that script. <coughs> Another interesting refinement is uh, the fact that well sometimes you want to um, to be able to do things like doing something before the script runs and something after for example um, and the, the thing is that uh, scripts are actually implementing a run method and somehow the body of uh, a script is as if uh, the, 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 the all the statements from that script are actually kind of on inside the run method, if you will. So I uh, override the, uh, the run abstract method from script and define my before and after. And instead, I create that new internal run abstract method. And when I define uh, the, that new base script for my script here, uh, it's going to uh, print uh, before and after because we are going to use uh, internal run to put the statements uh, inside that internal run method instead of in the usual uh, run method inherited from scripts. So that's handy if you want to. Uh, to do things a bit like, uh, you know, set up teardown in tests and things like that. So that's quite nice and handy. We have a new IO2 module. So um, for those who are used to uh, all the GDK methods around uh, what you can do with uh, files, like getting a reader, uh, iterating over each line of a file, uh, iterating uh, or um, traversing um, a directory uh, recursively and uh, uh, get all the, um, all the files uh, recursively. Or also the, uh, the new operators like uh, the left shift, etc. All those methods are now also available on path. Uh, so uh, you, you'll be uh, right at home because that's uh, um, the, the very same methods. And we also have some other ideas of uh, things uh, for example, in the Java new IO file files um, class from uh, Java 7 and 8, uh, there are some static uh, utility methods which just look like uh, groovy GDK methods. So static uh, methods with uh, uh, file, path, etc. as a first parameter. And so we might be able to uh, further improve that new IO2 module by uh, offering those uh, handy methods coming uh, in that files 
class, utility class. So more on that soon. <coughs> in Groovy 2.3, uh, we have a pretty much full rewrite of the JSON parser and uh, the JSON builder. Uh, and the, 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 the key uh, aspect is really speed and efficiency. So uh, it was contributed by uh, two guys, Rick Hightower and Andrei, uh, I never managed to remember his name, uh, Belestov. Be Be <laughs> uh, it's a Russian uh, name and uh, I'm not good at probably at remembering Russian names. I'm sorry for uh, uh, not doing justice to his name. Um, and uh, both uh, Rick and, uh, and uh, Andre did, um, or is it Andre or Alexei? Now I don't, I'm not even sure of his first name anymore. Ah. <laughs> so Andre, thank you. And um, uh, they, they, they worked on some uh, benchmarks uh, to compare uh, Groovy and um, Jackson and uh, Gson uh, from Google. And uh, Groovy is pretty much uh, on all benchmarks uh, three or four times faster, well, depending on the benchmark, uh, than uh, what's available uh, elsewhere. So in Groovy, you've got the fastest uh, JSON support across the JVM, right? So it's not just you know, faster than one thing, but it's really faster than everything. <laughs> so that's pretty cool. And uh, for 2.4, there's a... Um, also um, a pull request to uh, further improve the, uh, the builder as well, to improve further the performance. So that's pretty cool. There are new modes for parsing, so I won't detail them all, but I'll just list one, or, or at least um, I'll just say that there are certain modes which are uh, faster for small payloads and some which are better for a huge JSON payload. So you may have, you may, you, you could uh, decide to use one or the other if you know the characteristics of the JSON content that you have to, to parse. But uh, the one I'm going to show you is the lax mode. So um, it's not laxative, it's uh <laughs> more, <laughs> you know. Uh <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Should have said that. Sorry. Can we cut that? Uh <laughs> no. Okay. Never mind. So you, <laughs> so you set um, the uh, the parsing mode like that. You said uh, you say set type lax. And it's returning the that JSON slurper that you just inst instantiated. And what's interesting is that it's a relaxed mode not uh, the other word I used, a relaxed mode where it's not conform conformant to the JSON specification, but uh, you can add things like comments. You can use either uh, double slash or you can use the, the pound style. Both are uh, available. And you can omit uh, the, um, the quotes around the keys. You can even use uh, single quotes and not just double quotes. Uh, as well for uh, things like strings, <coughs> etc. So it's pretty handy uh, for things like configuration files. If you want to say, okay, this part of that JSON configuration file is about this or that, etc. So it's a relaxed uh, JSON parser, which is quite interesting and nice for configuration files. Okay, there's a new markup template engine. <coughs> which is uh, particularly nice for um, generating XML and HTML <laughs> content, but it's uh, not just restricted to a markup. And uh, it's pretty fast. Uh, Cedric did some comparisons also against things like uh, Velocity, etc., and it's uh, super fast. You can in even do uh, internationalization uh, if you want to have your templates uh, translated in different languages. And let me show you that in action. So here, you know, that's my template and it just looks like a, a usual markup builder or in other existing builders in, in Groovy. So let's say I have a, uh, I want to create some, well, I'm going to show you what it's going to generate, but you, you already get the idea. You have a cars tag, then for each car uh, from the cars collection, uh, you're going to create a new tag with a, a make, a name, etc. So let me show you a model. So this is my model. So you've got cars. This is the same cars that we see here. And I've got two cars with make and name. 
and you feed the model into your template and we'll see how to do that and then it's going to generate that stuff which is you know just like uh, the marker builder and how you can do that so here I'm defining the markup template engine. I'm passing some configuration. So there are various configuration options that uh, I'm going to mention afterwards. And here, for example, just for the sake of uh, the briefty of this example, I'm just generating a new uh, uh, paragraph. And I'm passing, uh, I'm using the, uh, the, the name uh, attribute from the, f from the model. And here, I just use map to define my model and I pass that model to the make method uh, like uh, the, the other existing template engines. So this is how you can do uh, what you saw in the previous slide. There are uh, includes, so you can uh, include other templates within templates. Uh, you can also include stuff uh, unescaped if you've got some raw content or escaped if you want to escape uh, uh, things like um, uh, less than signs, etc. You can also use yield, yield, yield and escape, just like in uh, the usual builders. Uh, you can define XML de particular XML declarations. You can define comments. You can add new lines, processing instructions. And in terms of uh, configuration options, uh, you can declare the encoding, what else? Use double quotes instead of single quotes, define a locale, etc. So there are uh, many interesting options and also how you want to format things uh, if you want auto escaping and so on. So there are various options. And uh, so in uh, Groovy 2.4 also there are some uh, layout capabilities. So I'm not showing them here because it's about Groovy 2.3, uh, but there are some uh, refinements uh, coming up or actually even already in 2.3.2. Two. They, they were actually added in 2.3.2. Two. So I could have added that in my slides, actually, but I forgot. And what's nice as well is that um, it's compatible with uh, compiled static. So you can get compilation errors uh, if a variable uh, you're using is not present, etc., and also have faster templates. Um, <coughs> With type check model creation methods, uh, there's a, an alternative method for uh, creating uh, type check templates. Or you can also do things a bit differently by defining uh, your model inside your template, and then you can use the usual create template method. What's, what's interesting with that, uh, no, uh, I thought I had a, another slide. What's interesting with that is that even if you have uh, things like dynamic calls like you know uh, creating a, a paragraph etc uh, all, all the the code will otherwise be uh, type checked and uh, compiled statically so that you can get the dynamic aspects of the the markup uh, methods as well as the fast and type safe aspects uh, for a code which is not about the markup so that's very powerful and that's also what makes uh, this particular template engine uh, very uh, very fast and um, the, the guys from Spring Boot uh, have integrated uh, the, the Groovy uh, markup template engine as the, the, the default uh, view technology now for the next version of Spring Boot, uh, which is 1.1, right? And it's in available in the latest RC that they released a few days ago. Yeah. Okay, next. Documentation overhaul. So we started uh, overhauling our documentation using uh, 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 Skid Doctor, but we also took a chance to uh, update a little bit the uh, the look and feel of uh, Groovy Doc. So the the new Groovy Doc looks a bit like that. So this was with a two three zero snapshot, but that's uh, pretty much the same uh, look and feel. And uh, well, this is a, an example of a particular <laughs> class here. The, the Groovy GDK documentation uh, also adopts the same look and feel. So you can see all the methods that we added to uh, the, the JDK. So that's the same, uh, yeah, same style as the, the new Groovy doc. And when you do generate Groovy doc uh, documentation, it's using that new style instead of the old uh, one, two, th one, three uh, Java style, and which got updated then in five or six, and then re-updated for eight, I think. And uh, we we've been working on uh, the new uh, documentation using ASCII Doctor. Um, uh, it's still 
a work in progress. Uh, we, s we already studied it uh, uh, a while ago, um, but there, there are still many uh, sections which are need to be uh, filled. So if you fancy helping us writing some documentation, don't hesitate. We are welcoming you uh, uh, to help us. And it's also a great way also to you know, learn about a specific topic or uh, uh, being better as a, at a certain, uh, the, the understanding of some uh, more advanced features, etc. Um, and uh, uh, also uh, what I wanted to mention, so the, this documentation is uh, written with ASCII doctor. And uh, what's nice as well is that the, um, the, 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 the snippets of code that you find in that documentation are actually extracted from real unit tests which means that all the snippets of code you find in that documentation are tested. So it's an executable documentation because it's going to always be up to date with uh, that version of uh, Groovy. Compared to our old wiki that will be uh, decommissioned at some point when we uh, set up our new uh, Groovy website. Uh, in the old documentation you might have holes, you might have things which are not correct anymore because Groovy evolved, etc. Here, the, uh, the snippets of code will be correct and be sure to be working. So that's important to have up-to-date and accurate documentation of the language. And uh, so we already used this uh, uh, domain name, groovylang.org, a little bit. Uh, for example, for uh, publishing the new documentation, etc. And uh, we are working with a, with a web designer uh, when he got some time, so not that much time, but uh, we, so we are progressing slowly on that as well. Uh, so this is more or less what the uh, the future uh, Groovy website uh, will look like. And then a few words about Groovy 3. So I'm not really mentioning Groovy 2.4 here, but um, um, so it's going to be a refinement uh, to the JDK 7 and 8 support uh, plus, well, a few other uh, minor things, and we'll be trying to do a, a shorter release cycle so that we can try to focus on Groovy 3. And uh, Groovy 3 is a big, uh, uh, how to say that, a big, um, and it's an understatement, it's a big topic, <laughs> uh, well, because we really want to overhaul various aspects of the language, and it's so complex uh, that it's hard to get everything in the brain and uh, really able to uh, reason about that is uh, quite difficult. So Groovy 3, you, you should see Groovy 3 as the, the long-term uh, evolution of Groovy uh, because we, we've been speaking of the new mob, uh, Groovy 3, etc. for years, literally, and uh, we're really progressing very slowly. So it, it'll be there at some point, but now I'm not giving dates anymore because you cannot trust me on, on dates on, on that topic. But hopefully we'll get there. <laughs> So the always the usual suspects uh, in terms of roadmap. So the new meta object protocol, and I invite you to have a look at uh, Johan's presentation uh, about uh, the, the the latest um, discussions about what we want to do uh, around the, the new map, like uh, basing it on the invoke dynamic support of JDK seven and uh, eight. And we're even wondering whether, uh, so Groovy 3 will definitely need at least JDK 7, but we're even wondering if we, if we sh shouldn't be using JDK 8 as a requirement. That's, that's a pretty tough choice to make, as you can imagine. Um, we, um, you know, over the, the course of the evolution of Groovy, uh, we've kind of layered several sediments on top of each other. So uh, back in the day, we had, uh, let's say, uh, just the Groovy object methods. Then there, there, there were the categories. Then uh, the custom meta classes. Then we added expando meta classes coming from um, coming from uh, Grails, etc. And progressively, you add stuff on top of stuff. And sometimes there are some inconsistencies. So uh, let's say uh, invoke method is not working quite the same in expando meta class and Groovy object, etc. So We'd like to rationalize that and make things more coherent, more consistent. Um, we also have some other uh, things in mind, like uh, a notion of realm, how you can shield uh, 
a part of your program or uh, of your library uh, from monkey patching, like someone hacking uh, two string on object, and then all, all the stuff using two string on any object is going to be uh, impacted by uh, that monkey patching stuff. Uh, so we are trying to uh, be able to have a final control on how you can segregate uh, stuff um, to uh, be able to use metaprogramming, but in a safer way. We also, uh, you know, the, the infamous private visibility uh, issue. So people love that as well because uh, you're able to test private stuff uh, in Groovy very easily. So that's nice, but on the other hand, sometimes you use uh, dot size instead of dot size parents parents and oh accidentally you're using the private field instead of calling the the method and that you you get some surprising uh, behavior sometimes uh, so we want to uh, tackle that problem as well with the new mop and um, at the last groovy devcon meeting so we uh, uh, every year now uh, for the past uh, few years the uh, the the, the great conf uh, team and uh, organization uh, has been sponsoring uh, the Groovy uh, developers, core developers, um, offering them a, a nice room and, uh, and to be able to meet up and have some face-to-face -face meetings between, between us. So uh, thanks a lot to uh, GreatConf for uh, helping Groovy moving forward because, uh, you know, we work in a distributed fashion, but sometimes uh, being able to do face-to-face -face meetings allows us uh, to, to make real progress on certain key complicated aspects. So GreatConf uh, is helping the Groovy project there, even financially, you know, uh, by uh, renting rooms for us. Um, and uh, at the last uh, Groovy DevCon meeting we had, we even thought about a special notation to be explicit that, okay, I want to access private stuff, but otherwise, by default, when you do dot something, uh, it's never going to access private stuff. So that's one of the things we've uh, thought about uh, thanks to those Groovy DevCon meetings. Um <coughs> Groovy, the, the, the syntax, the grammar of the Groovy language uh, is derived from a, a Java grammar which was using Antler, the Antler uh, parser generator tool. But we were using Antler v2 which is a very old uh, version of Antler, and uh, Antler v4 was released, uh, uh, when was that? Uh, at least uh, more than six months ago. And uh, we'd like to uh, take a chance to uh, be uh, able to evolve the language and add new constructs and that kind of stuff more easily. Uh, because uh, now, if you want to make a small change in the grammar, it's very hard because of the heritage coming from Java, from all the constructs Groovy added. So, especially with Antler v2, it's even harder to do. Uh, but Antler 4 is more tolerant uh, how to resolve ambiguities in the grammar, etc. Uh, so, uh, it's going to be a, a good opportunity for us uh, to move the language forward uh, if ever we, we want to add things like some of the Java 8 syntax elements back into Groovy 3, for instance. Um, so we'll see what we adopt from Java 8, perhaps not everything, uh, but uh, that's something that we, we can debate, by the way. And uh, what's nice is that uh, Groovy has been selected as part of the Google, uh, <laughs> Groovy Summer of Code, that Google Summer of Code, right? Google Summer of Code. But it's a Groovy one, you know. So Groovy has been accepted as an orga organization uh, for the this year's uh, Google Summer of Code, and we've got a student uh, who's already started working on that new Antler v4 grammar for Groovy. So again, when I say new grammar, that doesn't mean that the syntax of Groovy changes, but it's just an implementation an implementation detail for us that it's based on a new tool, but the syntax is still uh, the same. In terms of uh, Java 8 support. Um, Th and that's what I mentioned uh, we should be uh, debating. Uh, Java 8 adds uh, things like lambdas, like method references, default methods and interfaces, new APIs. Uh, you can put annotations on more places and you can also repeat annotations. And, you know, historically, uh, Groovy uh, has been kind of uh, copy and past compatible with Java. That's also what helped 
uh, getting Groovy adopted by uh, thousands and thousands of uh, developers worldwide. But should we continue to be as close as Java as possible? Or, for example, you remember the slide where I showed you the uh, wherever you have a Lambda, you can actually use already a Groovy closure. Does it mean we should also support the Lambda syntax? Or we can just stick with the Groovy syntax and, and its Groovy closures? The question is open. Um, we have um, we have uh, our method pointers, which create closures over uh, other methods. So it's a bit like method references, but method references in Java 8 allow th certain things which are not possible with our method references. So should we enhance our existing method references uh, or uh, <coughs> closure method pointers, or should we just use the one from Java 8 or support both? Because if you, you know, Java adds something, but we also add something else, uh, how you, our users, are going to say, okay, so when should I use that one or the other? You might have some confusion and not being able to decide what is best to use. And uh, for things like the APIs, uh, it's okay, because, you know, that's just Java API, so you can use them from, from Groovy, but uh, obviously we can make them even groovier, so that's a bit of one of the goals of Groovy 2.4 and, and beyond. And things like uh, annotations on types and repeated annotations, it's certainly something we'll need to support without even a uh, question. But there are certain things like lambdas. Uh, perhaps we don't really need lambdas and have two different kind of closures. Or like in uh, languages like Ruby, where you have prox, uh, lambdas, and open block or something like that. I'm, I'm not uh, a big expert in Ruby, but they have like three different ways of defining uh, their kind of functions. Uh, so it can be also a bit confusing. So uh, if ever you, you have some feedback on that, don't hesitate to come and see me or Cedric or Jochen uh, and chat about uh, those topics with us, your opinion, the things you like in Java 8 that you'd like to see in Groovy, uh, etc. So we uh, warmly welcome that kind of feedback. So in summary, um, my summary will be very short. Groovy rocks the JVM since 2003. And, uh, you know, that's about it. <laughs> so thanks a lot for your attention. And uh, I'm happy to take a few questions because I think I've got a, uh, yeah, one uh, a few minutes left, I think. Right, no, it's uh, five minutes left, yeah, so I'm correct. Yes? So issues in compatibility when you use traits. So I'm not sure what you what uh, uh, problem you're referring to. I'm reading that uh, when you use traits dynamically, then uh, the, the object that you use is not exactly. Ah, the yeah. So it's a, it's a proxy, uh, just like you know as uh, when you do coercion, like a, a map or a, a closure as something. It's it's creating a proxy. Uh, over the like the interface um, which you say as some interface and it's still the same mechanism so when you do traits at runtime the uh, instances that you get uh, are instance of uh, those interfaces but they are not instance of the original uh, class uh, that, that you were using so yes that's still that still applies yeah Andres Mm -hmm. So in the, uh, the code, you show that map can take a closure and then you have a method invocation for each. How can we know that it <coughs> for each method belongs to this string and is not a method on the closure class itself? Um, on the closure, in, in my example, uh, it's not. Let me uh, come back to that example uh, here or actually uh, perhaps in the other one here. So so, so the closure here, uh, I mean the for each method, that's the, for the second example. Ah, the, the, uh, here? Yes. With the current syntax without supporting lambdas, the uh, Groovy will assume that the for each method belongs to the closure class. No, no, it's uh, applied to re the result of that map call taking a closure. So it's not part of the closure class.
Mm. Mm. It's, uh, it's always been the result of map and the, the closure to which has been applied uh, on which you're calling uh, for each. So it hasn't changed. Yeah, we'll have to um, to see because uh, perhaps I we're not uh, on the same wavelength on that, but it uh, it still applies just like I it's always been, I think. Um, and um, so we use the same kind of uh, type inference logic as uh, uh, the Java 8 does, which is to to find. Uh, it looks at the, the map and for each method, and there's a functional interface, um, and we uh, coerce transparently that uh, closure uh, to the functional interface, uh, just like Lambda uh, do in, uh, in Java 8. One more question, yeah, over, over, over there, Sasha. Delegate and such. Yeah, so you, you still have a variable capture. Uh, it's, I mean, even if he, it's a closure here, we do coerce to the functional interface. So what's really passed as parameter to map and for each to an instance of, well, implementing the functional interface uh, as per the, uh, the, the, the method signature. Uh, so we haven't really played all that much with. Um, Lambda, well, the, um, the, the, the Java 8 uh, functional interfaces, but uh, you <coughs> might be able to do a fancy stuff as well with delegates and such, but we haven't played too much with that yet. So, uh, on the basic level, if you use groovy closures just like you would use lambdas, but with the groovy syntax, it just behaves the same as uh, with lambda, uh, lambda from Java 8. Okay, well, thanks a lot for your attention again and enjoy the rest of the conference.